Hello there friends, it's me Speedy. A little bit ago I put out a video tutorial on how to make a run cycle wherein I pondered the idea of making a sequel video about a looping parallax background for this run cycle and doing a tutorial on that as well. I'm pretty sure exactly one person commented saying that would be cool and that was enough motivation for me to make the thing, so here we are. If you haven't seen the run cycle tutorial I put out before, I'll link it up in the top right here. It's not strictly necessary to watch that one first, but I do go over some basic setup and shortcuts that I won't really be repeating here. If you're curious about that or how to make a run cycle like the one that I have here, you can check that out. Now then, as for what exactly we'll be doing on this tutorial, we may have already guessed that I'm mainly to be focused on Tomb Boom. However, I'll also be making an effort to show how you can pretty easily make a parallaxing background in any old art program and an editing program. If you have access to making keyframes, this should work out pretty well. If you don't, making parallax is impossible per se, but I honestly wouldn't try it. It will give you at least a 9 on the Furby Pain scale. This will also be a general parallax advice tutorial where I'll show the two main ways I create depth in Toon Boom. I either manually move elements with keyframes, or I utilize Toon Boom's top view keyframes so I can create depth using the camera. I'll be including examples outside of this cycle, examples which largely don't loop, so they're going to be a lot more free to go wild. Without further delay, let's get into our first subject, making an in-program looping background. First things first, we reopen our run cycle file from before. The first bit I'm going to be doing is what I usually name BG main, meaning main background. This is going to be a layer with the section of the background closest to our character. It's likely going to be the second most complex part of the background. For setting up this part of the background, the first thing I'm going to do is make these fancy red lines. I'm going to do my best to use these to figure out how to line up the, where the background will start to loop. After I put these red lines down, I start sketching away. You may have noticed also I've got quite a few layers listed as sub-layers to a layer with an orange box on it. This orange box layer is a group layer that I've made to keep things less cluttered. They're like pegs, except they fully collapse and can have effects placed on them that will be applied to everything within the group. I create one of these by selecting all the layers I want with shift and or control, then I right click and press group selection. We can then choose to toggle expanding or compressing a group by pressing control I. Now, what we're going to be putting into the main background here is going to be of your own personal choice, but I would try to make sure not to clutter it too much. This should show the ground the character is actively running on. The further back parts of the background are a way where we can really show what's in our environment. After I got my sketch down, I quickly switch over to my invisible line tool by pressing Alt V and making sure to press Alt K so I can see what I'm doing and not crash my PC. I then outline the sketch with the visible line and fill it in with a medium gray using our fill unfold area bucket tool. I'm going to be filling in every layer like this with a different shade of gray. The darker ones in front and the lighter ones in the back. Importantly, I'm going to be staying on the same color layer for this. This is because I'm going to be copy pasting this sketch and its gray filling to test out how my background will transition from end to beginning. Now I do just that. We're going to copy paste the whole sketch and test how it will be placed to the left and right, lining up with our fancy red line. Now, stepping back from what recording me did for a moment, I should say this red line method is honestly not the best way I could have lined things up. If I were to do this again, I would outline the entire sketch with a red rectangle and then copy paste that. That way the top and bottom are much easier to line up. I'd advise that technique rather than just the red line I go with in this tutorial. After I feel I've successfully lined things up, we've finally gotten to the point of making this background actually portray the idea of the character running through it. For this, I'm going to add a peg to my BG main layer. I do this by selecting the layer and clicking this button. This will create a peg named after the BG main layer, with BG main automatically placed underneath it. It's important to do this step as pegs will allow you to add keyframes that affect the content it's got linked underneath. These are basically layer folders, except you can hide pegs and this will not hide anything else underneath it unless the peg has been compressed using this arrow. Next thing to do is select the very first frame on my peg layer. Press F6 to make a new keyframe and then use the translate tool to slide my main background to where I want it to be at the start of the cycle. The starting point should have the most of the background laid out in front of the character. When you translate the background also, make sure to tap on the arrow which indicates the left or right until it turns purple. When this arrow is purple, it indicates that you are locked on horizontally moving whatever you're holding onto. This will make sure you don't accidentally make the background move diagonally and make the loop look odd. Then we're going to test out finding where the end of the main background's loop will be. 
We create another keyframe at what's currently the end of our scene and translate the sketch until we've got the frame that loops back into the first frame well. I say what's currently at the end also because we're going to be making the scene double its length later on. Right now the whole scene is 54 frames, but by the end it'll be 108. This means the main background will actually loop twice throughout the cycle, making room for the slower panning bits further back to have their full cycles. Once I'm happy with how the loop looks, both loop and speed wise, I move on to the next part of the background. I call this part of the background BG mid as in middle background. It's my in-between separating my main background from my far undetailed backgrounds and gradients. We repeat what we just did with the main background here, just adding in a little bit more detail this time however, as we can get away with adding more elements without making this whole thing feel cluttered. I also like to try and add in some details here that show some important things about our character's world. For example, in this middle background I've included a big wall of earth, with tunnels in them. This is because in the story my character is from, Tunnelers, shockingly, tunnels are very important in their world. As we finish up our sketch, we, again, use the invisible line tool and fill in the sketch with a slightly lighter shade of grey. Then we copy paste it a bit, give it a peg, and translate some keyframes at our start and new end. This loop will take up all 108 frames of my scene. After this, you may be wondering, how will the further back bits of the background loop then if the loops have been taking longer moving further backwards? Well, I kind of cheated. I noticed that with my middle background, there was a large portion of time where my rock wall covered up further parts of the background. So when I made BG back, or my back backgrounds, I decided to have their loop suddenly reset while covered up so that it can pan slower while not having to make the scene longer. This won't always work, unfortunately. If my closer backgrounds didn't just happen to cover up what was further back, I would have had to double my scene length so everything looped smoothly. But I had the opportunity to cheat, so I did. Now, my back backgrounds are just going to be silhouettes to keep things simple, and the furthest back layer is actually just going to be a still image of a gradient, so once we finish translating BG back, we're basically done. Now we can take the time to mess around with the timing of the loops a bit more, but I think things are actually looking pretty good. The next step to work on then is creating the elements that will go in front of our character, starting with some grass. Now, Adding grass isn't strictly necessary, but I like doing it simply because it makes the character feel more connected to what's around them. I'm also just going to go straight to final lines for this, since I don't really feel the need to sketch the grass. Because of this, I want to make sure that the grey I fill in the grass with will match the grey from the main background, but also not necessarily be constrained to the exact same colour in my palette. This specification can be important, because if we fill it in with some random grey in the palette full of one-off colours, It'll be annoying to deal with when we're coloring. We may end up having to manually recolor the grass just so things aren't cluttered. And then, of course after we do the grass, we have our most important element that goes in front of the character, the foreground. Which I definitely didn't make a layer for, then completely forget about for several days until I looked at the render I posted and went, mm, where is it? So we do the foreground, which is pretty simple but also can be quite important to create an environment. For foregrounds, I typically just put some bushes that poke up into the camera view intermittently along the timeline. I then make sure the foreground isn't always a thing, in order to avoid cramping up the space and blocking everything. I'll also usually put in one tree that blocks our view along the way, but I don't like the tree getting repeated all that much, so I usually delete it in one of the pasted versions I've got. Now, in Tumum, you may have noticed that even though my foreground goes in front of my character, my foreground layer is actually underneath both my grass and Ren. How does it do that without getting covered up by the other two? Well, this is our first instance of using Toon Boom's top view. Before setting movement keyframes, I'm going to create a new peg and just have one singular keyframe on it. With this keyframe selected, I find where my top view is. If your top view isn't visible in your interface, you can quickly grab it from the window drop down menu. Then I select my Maintain Size tool and drag my foreground and the top view closer to the bottom of this big V, which is showing the scope of the camera. This will make sure the foreground is on top of everything else, no matter where its actual layer is. Importantly, you'll want to make sure that if you're ever moving something to the top view, do not use the Translate tool. Only ever use the Maintain Size tool, because if you don't, your element will grow or shrink as it moves around the top view, which is not usually what you want. The top view is a very nice Tumum tool. I'm not sure what other animation programs have this as a thing, so if you're using another program, such as an editing program, you'll probably just have to place the foreground layer above everything else in your layers menu. 
Now after sketching stuff out, we do our grey fill-in and pasting again. Then we go to keyframing the actual movement. Since the foreground is so close, it whizzes by real fast. This makes it fun to play with. Where the keyframes go depends on what you personally think fits best with the run. Looping the foreground is usually pretty easy also, since I made it so that it isn't always there. The loop can usually simply start and end on frames where nothing in the foreground is visible. Once we've got it to a place we like, we're done with our sketch. I like to play back a few times to make sure I really like how it looks. Unfortunately though, it can be a bit hard to tell without at least doing a preview render of what the actual loop looks like. These files have already gotten pretty darn beefy at this point, so just playing in the OpenGL view may be difficult. If we've actually managed to see what the render looks like though, and we like it, time to start lining. So now we start that painful process. Firstly, we've got to set all our background sketches to have a far lower opacity and add more to the palette where our grass color should be. Filling up the palette with different colors we'll be using for the different elements of the background. You could potentially just wing it and pick colors you think would work well, or use a reference image like I've got. My main background will be grayscale, since that's the comic style, but I also plan on using some color override layers later to make a couple different versions. Besides setup, there's not a whole lot to say about this bit, I'm just using the pencil tool, all four slash for those who love shortcuts, again to line. Though this time with a brush that actually has a pen pressure. I'll also be switching out the size of this brush for different parts of the background, using a much thicker brush for the closer parts of the background and a much thinner brush for that what's further away. There's also a very helpful layer attribute you can use to help you focus on one part of the background at a time. Next to the eyes icon, which toggle layers on and off, is the singular eye. Clicking this enables solo mode. If you've got a layer in solo mode, that is the only layer you can see it unless you turn solo mode off. You can have multiple layers selected for solo mode at a time, and they will appear as well. If you want to toggle all the other layers' visibility, you can click this same singular eye icon that's above all the layers. This will toggle solo mode in its entirety, on or off. If you had some layers selected and turned it off, you can toggle it back on and all your solo mode layers will be saved. However, if you toggle it off, then enable solo mode on a specific layer, Solo mode will be turned back on, and all the layers you had selected for solo mode before will have solo mode suddenly disabled. I realize that whole jumble of words may sound a bit confusing, so just play around with solo mode yourself if you think it might be helpful. It's one of those things that's easier to figure out by using it than having it explained verbally. Now, just as you get to watch as I suffer lining everything, I'm also going to be coloring as I go along so I can see how my layers hold up. I recommend doing this. We're also going to be revisiting our old buddies. Alt-T, the cutter tool, Alt-C, the closed gap tool, Alt-V, create invisible line tool, Alt-Y, fill unfold area bucket tool. Closed gap is especially about to be my best friend because I have a lot of lines that I haven't quite connected, so I need to patch them up in order to color. As always, remember to press K before using the closed gap or invisible line tool because Tumu might get angry and crash if you do not. Now then, as we're working on the main background, we run into the sudden issue of actually having the line where the two ends of our background meet. This can be tricky, but what I'd mainly advise to do is simply go ahead and line right through to where the two parts intersect. I then copy paste the whole background and try to evenly line them up side by side, sometimes using rectangles and stuff to make sure it hasn't drifted up or down. For the main background, figuring out where the intersection was was actually pretty easy. It was just some grass meeting, which is usually what I try to go for. After we've got that, we've just got to color this layer and get to the next one. On the middle background, I decided to go for an overlap that was a little bit more complex. This time the background repeats where the tree meets the wall. The way I found it best to do this was to line the whole thing, ignoring the tree completely. Then I copy pasted what I had and lined up the ground using a rectangle. After fixing up the ground, I added in the tree and everything was sorted. This was quite a bit harder to work on than just having a little bit of grass turn into a different bit of grass, but I like how this bit looks, so I'm happy with it. After that, I'm actually done with the lines, weirdly enough. The silhouettes are technically lined, but they get completely filled in. Figuring out what their overlap is is also not really necessary for me, because their transition back into one another is covered up. It may be necessary for a different cycle though, so watch out. My gradient is also already done, so once the back background is done, we're done both with lining and coloring. Yippee! 
Now we just gotta do shading and oh boy, this is where the lag really starts to set in, thanks to all the transparent lines. For my shading, I was following the guidelines I made for the comic background style. I have one transparent shading layer that fills out the lighter shadows and one opaque layer where I use the color of my lines to create the darkest areas. After completing the shading for my main background, I moved on to the middle background, planning to repeat the same shading. However, I decided to omit the darker opaque shading this time around. This was because I was aiming to create more depth to the atmospheric perspective, which points out as one of its main ideas that shadows get lighter as things get farther away. After the completing the shading for my big backgrounds, I also decided to shade the grass I made to make Ren feel more immersed in the scene. You may notice, however, that I also had to copy paste this little bush and its shading on some of my frames. This is because Ren accidentally stepped on top of it before and the grass also went over it and they weren't supposed to do that. The frames where this bush is present are duplicates though, since for the majority of the frames, that part of the background is not an element. This is just important to point out as it shows that you can always do stuff like this to make your cycle look better. You don't have to just give up or go in and kill the tiny bush, although you probably could just do that and kill the bush, they'd be fine. After doing the grass, I then move on to complete the foreground. After that, we're done with this version. Now, after waiting a painfully long time, we get this thing to render and hooray! Look at our fancy little run cycle, isn't that neat? Along with this version, also I did export some flat color versions along the way. One is the comic version, one is just some random normal version, and the other is actually an homage to the very first parallax background I did in 2020. Oddly enough, the character featured was also Ren, but back then he looked like this. Back then, I only had Krita and Fomora when it didn't have keyframes, so I'm not actually sure how in the world I made this. I don't think I had a great time of it, however, looking at some of the file names I had for this project. I think what I may have done was manually move every single frame of the background at a consistent pace to create parallax. Do not do that. That hurt. I also felt the need to share that I inflicted massive psychic damage onto myself after struggling through massive lag spikes in a 10 minute render time to get the normal color shaded version out from Toon Boom, only for this to happen. Apparently I tested something out with a peg that made him run off, and then I forgot to delete that and accidentally re-enabled it just in time to start rendering. Do not be stupid like me. Make sure your character has not run away before you render. You may also have noticed that the two versions I showed at the start were not actually in fact the same as the renders I made from Toon Boom. These were actually edited in After Effects. I'm not very experienced in After Effects though, so I don't plan on walking through exactly what I did. Instead, I implore everyone to go check out Menu Mercurials, a video on animation post-production, linked up in the top right to learn a lot of awesome stuff about the program. It helped me a lot when figuring out how I wanted to edit this. Now, that way making parallax worked pretty well, but it's not actually the method I choose to use most often. I actually haven't lined, colored, or shaded in backgrounds in Toon Boom since January of 2021. I only ever make the sketch in Toon Boom. Why? The lag is a big part of it, but also I just don't get to be as free with how my backgrounds look if I stay in Toon Boom. What I like doing now is screenshotting my sketch, importing that into Clip Studio, and making a finalized version of the background there before saving the different layers as their own images, and importing those back into Toon Boom. That's what we're going to be testing out next, making an alternate version of this cycle's backgrounds using Clip Studio Paint and either Toon Boom or an editing program. First off, we screenshot our sketch and import it into Clip Studio Paint. If you're using Clip Studio, I'd advise against using that Create New From Clipboard button because the screenshot is not going to provide very good quality dimensions. Rather, make a completely new file, put in some dimensions you think will work well, and then paste in your sketch from there. Also, just for clarity's sake, when I say sketch, I do mean something super simple, like a few little guiding lines here and there. Nothing as solid as what I'm actually using here. For example, this is what I gave myself to work with for my next step forever part. Now, I'm going to be really rough with this and only demonstrate the technique with the main background since doing the others would just be repeating the same things we just did with the non-important background. I'm going to be using a more painterly style right now, but it should be noted that making a background just like the one we lined in Toon Boom before is a fine choice here. Now I just flesh out the background and this guy's almost ready to be imported. But wait, we need to make it loop. For this, I make the whole background into a single layer, use the rectangular marquee to grab the far left of this background, copy-paste it, and drag the pasted version over the right. 
Using the pasted version, I'm going to create a layer on top that smooths out the transition between the two sides. After I think this looks good, I copy paste this layer, send it back over to the right, and make sure the sides are in agreement, deleting whatever is underneath the pasted layer so there's no weirdness there. Once we've done that, the background is ready to be imported into Toon Boom. We open up our run cycle file once again, head over to File up in the top left, in the drop down menu we select Import Images. From here, we're going to get this pop-up window which asks us what we'd like to import and how. You can import multiple files at a time, which is quite nice. If I had done all the other backgrounds in Clip Studio and wanted to import them as well, I could select them all in files, then tell Toon Boom to give each of them their own layers. I could also very easily import a PNG sequence and get that to appear as individual frames in a single layer. It just depends on what I want. In any case, I've now selected my file. Since I only have the one, it doesn't really matter which layer settings I choose. What does matter though is this transparency setting box. This guy made me go absolutely bonkers for the first few months I used Toon Boom. This is because by default, Toon Boom selects pre-multiply with white. I'm not sure why this is the case, because if you have this selected, whatever you import will have any parts that are not either 100% or 0% opaque suddenly get blasted by a solid color. I've had it be white or green, but either way I did not like it and was very confused. In order to make it not do that, you need to have straight selected. This will make Toon Boom be normal about your transparencies. After we import the background, it will appear at the bottom of our layers. We can drag it to wherever we want it to be, and then we get to work. The first thing I decided to do here was just make sure Ren fit into this new background. So I made the grass which goes over his feet using a new technique. This time I go to my main Ren and Ren shading layers, add a layer, go to effects, and select cutter. We used cutter layers before to force the shading to conform to Ren's body, but this time we're actually going to be using the cutter layer to create space where these two layers are restricted from being. To make this distinction, all we simply do is we don't check the box that says inverted in the cutter layer settings. I'm also not going to make that's cutting into the layers visible, so there's no need to duplicate the new mat I'm going to make. Speaking of the mat, this will be the new layer I'm making called Grace, because I can't type. This will be the mat for both of the new cutter layers. Then, either using a brush or pencil with a charcoal texture, I draw in blades of grass for all of Ren's frames. I'm not going to try to make all this fancy this time, because that takes time, it's a very simplistic demonstration of the technique. The next order of business is to actually get our background looking good and moving. To do this, we make our keyframes again, then resize our background to how we'd like it to be. I tend to have my sketches at the size I want my backgrounds to be, so when I'm resizing, I turn back on the sketch layer and transform the imported background to look similar. Once the size looks good, I throw my sketch back into the void, copy paste my imported background, and line up the loop's edge. You'll notice this is way easier than trying to line up the in Toon Boom backgrounds before, since these backgrounds had their boundaries very well defined by rectangles. All you have to do is pick a feature of the background to line things up by. I chose this little plant at the bottom, and you've done it. The loop is very rough on this background, but it works well enough. If you spend a bit more time polishing your overlap than I did, it'll look grand. Then we've just gotta move around our keyframes since the transition from end to start is all smoothed out. One of the good things about this being an imported background is that also when we finally got the loop figured out, we don't have to actually render it to see what it looks like. The preview is already smooth because it's just moving a flat image around. Something also worth mentioning is the reusability of imported images for different scenes. Since they're not typically very laggy, you can copy-paste different bits of backgrounds over and over again to make different layers out of them, and trick the eye into thinking it's a completely different asset. Most recently, I did this for my lover's brother's killer's part. When looking at it, you may think I made two entirely separate backgrounds for this part, right? Well, I did not. I actually made the background specifically for the second shot first, then threw them into the first shot, copy-pasted a lot, and then made the backgrounds from the first shot entirely out of reused assets from the second. One of the layers is even a duplication of one of the assets, pushed farther back and moving slower so it looks like a completely separate bit of land. Now, this file is very laggy simply because Toon Boom is overwhelmed by how much is in it. However, I'm unsure if that's the background's fault or perhaps the 6,000 refs I have up here. Either way, it previews just fine after a few replays, which cannot be said for backgrounds I may have drawn here specifically in Toon Boom. Now, that was creating the loop in Toon Boom. For those who don't have Toon Boom, you may be wondering if you can do this in some other program, perhaps an editing program, and yes, you can. 
I'll be using Filmora X to demonstrate this, an editing program I just used because I got it years and years ago, not because it's particularly fantastic. It has keyframes, which makes this doable, but it's a little bit disagreeable and won't let you do things like copy-paste keyframes. It also maxes out at 400% dimension transformation, so the background is a bit skinnier than it should be. This could be easily fixed though by just having the proportions down better in your art program. The first thing you'll need to have differently here is simply you'll just need to have already made the background loop twice in your art program since Filmora has absolutely no way of duplicating your background in layer itself. This is fairly easy and can be done with basically the same technique we did over in Toon Boom. Once we've gotten that down, we can import a transparent Ren. Any version will be fine, he's just a reference image. And we also import our background and drag both of them onto the timeline. I already know that for every three cycles Ren has, the main background loops once, so I'm setting up my timeline based on that fact. If you don't have a clear idea of how many times you should go before looping, however, you can likely just mess around until you find a place that's good to loop. Now we just have to make our keyframes and move the background around, getting a good starting point and then making the end frame lead back to the start of the loop. And hooray, it's done! You could do this with all of your different layers, making them wider and taking longer to loop as they get further back, and you'll get a pretty good result. You can do this in any old editor with keyframes as well as top-notch programs. After Effects could be a good choice since there are a lot of other things you could do to the background once you've got it looping, but if you don't have access to that, this works just fine. Now comes our final dive into creating parallax and Toon Boom. Creating depth not by manually moving background elements, but by placing them in 3D space and moving the camera around. I'm not sure what other programs support this, so this is really just going to be Toon Boom centric. I use this in basically every full scene I animate, though it's not always obvious. Most recently I've been using it in my Mr. Blue Star Sky part, putting my characters at different depths in my picture plane to accentuate the sense of place for each of them. This is a really neat way of creating depth and it's actually pretty easy. As an example, I'll go through how I actually went about creating this effect in my Mr. Blue Sky part. Let's start with making the backgrounds. For making these backgrounds, I decided not to suffer through the lag brought about by making them in Toon Boom. Instead, I repeated what we did earlier by screenshotting some sketches I did while working on the basic idea for all these shots. Now, I did not want to make three different backgrounds, so I immediately tried to figure out how I could best grab these sketches and use them to make different elements I could repeat for every shot. What I ended up getting were two different screenshots. The first was this screenshot from the first background sketch, which I used to mainly sketch out the area where Tiger Claw and his little goons are. For the second, I used the third shot sketch of the foreground to create a spot for Fireheart to crouch on and run in. Once I figured that out, I imported these sketches into Clip Studio Paint and made them into final versions. Notably, I made them quite a bit bigger than I ever expected them to be in program, to avoid needing to get them sized up and lessening my need for duplications later. I also made up a lot of new parts that hadn't been in my sketch. This is necessary to me because things will need to move around to create depth and I need things to come in from the side and not just leave blank areas in them. Having more available for me allows for more flexibility. In case anyone's wondering also, because they have Clip Studio and like the look of these lines, the brush I'm using is called the SU Cream Pencil. You can find it on Clip Studio's assets store for free. I'll also link it in the description. I think it's very neat and I've been using it for about a year now. Check out if you're looking for a new Clip Studio paintbrush. Alright, now once I get all my different parts of the background done, I'm going to single out all my different pieces of the background layer by layer and render them as individual PNGs. For organization, I like to go to my Toon Boom project folder to create a new folder for all the backgrounds I made in Clip Studio, then I save the file and PNGs in there. I find this to be an easy way to keep things together, but Toon Boom won't get mad at you if they're not located inside the project folder. When all the PNGs are saved, we hop back over to Toon Boom. Here we're going to import all our backgrounds at once. This time, the layer setting we choose does actually matter. We're going to want to avoid create single layer and go right to create layers based on file names. Of course, we'll also want to make sure straight is selected and click OK. Now, we should have several different layers at the bottom of our layers list with a bunch of names based on what we saved them as in Clip Studio. I'm going to have to do some dragging around in the layers in order to get them in the correct order but this isn't strictly necessary because of what we're going to be doing in the top view. I still like to do it though. After this, I'm going to shift select the first frames for each of these shots, then right click them and give them a little frame marker so I can easily see where each shot begins. Now that the basic setup is all done, I shift select all the background layers I just imported and hit the add peg button. This will give all of them pegs that I can use to set their placement in the top view. 
Using the maintain size button from before, I'm going to push each of the pieces of the background to different spots in the top view again. Further up means that they're further back, and lower down means that they're closer up once again. Importantly, I've already added keyframes for all my characters in the top view, so they'll be moving in relation to this also. Some of these layers, like this layer I have with a big tree next to Fireheart, I'll want to have the same spot in the top view as Fireheart, because he's basically standing directly on top of it. To make sure these two elements are at the same level in the top view, I'm actually going to go into Fireheart's top view peg, copy the keyframe I set for him here, and paste it onto this tree's top view keyframe peg. As an additional small note for when you're creating these top view keyframes, you do have to be careful not to go too far backwards or forwards, because you could end up clipping behind your color card if you have one, or in front of the camera. In either case, your elements will seemingly vanish. After I set all these top keyframes, I also messed around with making a secondary peg where I used the transform tool to modify the dimensions of the backgrounds between shots. I only did this for the first shot, however, before switching up how I did these transformations. I changed things up because I honestly find the transform tool a bit tedious to use. So what I typically do instead is create duplicate frames of the backgrounds for each shot and make these dimension changes using the select tool, which you can access by hitting this button, Alt S, or by holding down control while using some tool like the brush or pencil. Using this tool also allows you to copy paste drawings, so that's neat. Once our transformations are all good, we can swipe through our timeline to see how well our illusion of depth is coming along. Importantly, you won't actually see any kind of depth here unless you add a camera layer and give it some movement. Let's quickly switch over to a little sketch test to see how to add in a camera and its movement. Here, I've got this little cat standing on some grass. He's on the main ground, but there's also a foreground with this tree and a bush, as well as some background mountains. To start creating the depth we want in this scene, we're going to first need to add a camera layer. We can do this easily by clicking our little plus and selecting camera from the drop down menu. Once we've got our camera in here, you'll notice that we can add keyframes to the camera layer and move around our viewing area with the translate tool. However, the motion between these keyframes will not be shown if we just do this. Toomba will ignore the keyframes and simply act as though we're moving the camera around in one frame no matter what. To actually create movement, we'll need to add a new peg to parent the camera layer. This will let us set keyframes and transition between each of them. Now we just create some keyframes to make these camera movements, as well as some top view keyframes to make sure these elements are in the right place in 3D space. And we've successfully set up the camera to create depth in our scene. This way of creating depth is pretty simple despite all the involved layers, but ends up getting us a pretty nice result. We're creating very intense moving scenes, both translating keys and top view keys can be really effective ways of creating depth in a 2D space. I'd recommend not just using one, but mixing both of these into your scene if they manage to both help out. The best example I have is my doctor part. Here, I've used the top view to create a sense of depth. The further things are from the camera, the less they move. However, when the second shot comes around, I got very hands-on with the ground forcing it to translate and rotate independently from the camera to show center pause momentum how I wanted it to. This is something I find works well to use in combination when necessary as they each work to make a scene feel more immersive. Well, that's all I really had to say about creating and using parallax through keyframing. I hope this was helpful and not too confusing. Good luck to anyone who wants to test this stuff out, it's lots of fun even if it can be a pain. If anyone has clarifying questions or wants me to do some other tutorial, let me know. Also, for anyone who's interested in the aforementioned comic Tunnelers, which is character and palette are for, the social medias are again already up. The Twitter, or X, has been purged, but we now have a webtoon where you can check out the test page I made for the comic in its new webtoony form. Whenever the prologue drops, I'll be sure to come swarm you all again about it here, so rest assured there is no escape. In any case, I'm Speedy, and now it's time for me to be productive elsewhere. Bye-bye!